Are there any questions from last time? I think we left off with the uh, aerosols and everything, greenhouse gases and aerosols come down to radiative forcing. Uh, as we said, it is essentially the imbalance. So if you think about the short wave and long wave we talked about, this is the excess that is being trapped now by the system. So some people call it uh, energy imbalance. Uh, I would think of it as a balance at a new temperature. So global warming increases the temperature, which means now the energy balance is happening at a warmer temperature. So it's remembering OLR is just sigma t to the fourth. So the appropriate coefficient. You can always change the emission temperature to uh, balance the um, incoming energy and what is being trapped by greenhouse gases. So if you think about positive contributions or increasing energy trapped by the system, then you can think of greenhouse gases. Of course, CO2 is the largest contributor right now. Methane is increasing, N2O is increasing, CFCs are supposed to be decreasing not monotonic yet, and you have stratospheric ozone, which is a cooling effect, basically absorbs UV, whereas if ozone is in the troposphere, it's a very strong greenhouse gas. So it's a contribution to global warming, plus uh, ozone in the troposphere is very dangerous for human health as well, if it is in the lower uh, layers near the surface. Sulfate. Okay, um, if it is forming near the surface, ozone, as far as I know, is, doesn't have any smell, but uh, as I said, bring the paper, we'll look at uh, the people who wrote it and whether they know what they're talking about. But ozone near the surface, uh, lightning strike is a huge energy, usually tends to form nitrates, which means oxygen is interacting with, reacting with uh, nitrogen. And it's one of the ways that the largest amount of nitrogen gets fixed. There's a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere, a lot of oxygen. You need nitrate for trees and for ocean plants and photosynthesis. So that's one way of forming. Ozone obviously also forms if you split oxygen. Uh, but the biggest source is not lightning. It is basically fossil fuel combustion, uh, cars, trucks, etc. They burn fossil fuel inefficiently, and they can produce ozone, right? Sulfate is a uh, emission from mostly coal burning, uh, and it is a negative contribution because it is a scatterer. It scatters shortwave radiation, but it dissolves in uh, rainwater and can form acid, acid rain and so on. So that's not good. Plus, this carbon particles, uh, that are emitted uh, along with sulfate, obviously are also not good for uh, health. Has a very short time scale, uh, residence time. So that's good in some ways, but obviously not uh, good enough if you cannot remove it. You will see that maybe this has contributed to some of the local cooling over uh, the North Atlantic. So these are all the aerosols. Uh, black carbon from fossil fuels, uh, it can absorb uh, solar radiation, but if it is uh, organic carbon from fossil fuels, then it can scatter uh, sunlight and cool, so you have a uh, net effect of warming here, but we'll see later on uh, that actually these uncertainties in these are quite high, okay? Biomass burning, which is basically all the chulas and uh, in India, Africa, um, a lot of other countries, poor countries, they burn. Um, for cooking and also they have slash and burn of agriculture and so on, which uh, contribute uh, negative because of scattering. Aerosol indirect effect, that is the impact on uh, cloud condensation, nuclei concentration, 
um, cloud physics, uh, water vapor condensation, et cetera. We think it's a net cooling effect, but you can see that there is a lot of uncertainty in it. Land use albedo uh, effect, basically if you uh, think of forests versus agriculture or uh, urbanization, forests have uh, much uh, lower albedo than shiny surfaces like uh, cemented surfaces or agriculture which uh, is not covered uh, all year long. So this is a cooling effect because they increase uh, the albedo. But again, uh, in terms of carbon, that's not a good thing because forests you expect would keep the carbon much longer than agriculture or, um, of course, urban areas. Um, solar radiation change, as we saw, there has been a positive contribution in the last century or so, but you can see it is much, much smaller than uh, now to that. Okay. Another way to look at it is in terms of uh, the human activities, and now you see some uncertainty here. So this is, again, radiative forcing just separating out the long-lived and the other contributions. So obviously, CO2 is uh, the longest lived, and 2 also has a long uh, residence time. Methane is about a decade. Uh, you can see the uncertainty in these are not very large. Stratospheric and tropospheric ozone, you can see the tropospheric ozone contribution to radiative forcing is, is large, mainly because it depends on the vertical profile, it depends on whether there's high traffic, whether you're in the city or you're in rural area, uh, how it gets mixed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because of global warming, stratospheric water vapor is increasing. There are many dynamic reasons why uh, this happens. If you put water vapor in the stratospheric ozone, um, I mean, in the stratosphere, that also, uh, obviously, water vapor is a very strong greenhouse gas, and it will increase greenhouse uh, forcing. Surface albedo, as we said, land use is negative, but you can see there's a significant uncertainty on it. Black carbon on snow, we know that it reduces albedo and increases snow melt rates. Again, higher uncertainties. Total aerosols, you can see cloud albedo effect, huge uncertainty. Direct effect is scattering. Uh, it's net negative, but again, there are uh, uncertainties or variances that are uh, fairly large. Contrails are what are uh, the emissions from airplanes and ships and so on that get uh, con condensed, and they have a uh, net effect, but right now they are small. But there are good uh, examples. For example, when 9-11 happened, all the flights were shut down over the US, and people could directly compare um, contrail contributions uh, between Europe and US and over the US and so on. So we have some data for uh, how this works. Solar radiance, uh, radiance um, net positive contributor with some uncertainty. So human activities in effect have so far contributed more than one and a half watt per meter squared uh, of radiative forcing. If you want to look at uh, animation quickly, just to uh, remember all the numbers, we talked about uh, uh, solar input, uh, various contributions, and various greenhouse gases that are uh, involved. And you have outgoing uh, shortwave radiation that has to try and balance uh, these. So you have um, concentrations of uh, carbon dioxide in the lower, troposphere, lower atmosphere or the troposphere. Uh, you had coming out of the deglaciation, 280 ppm. That was the percentage, so it is definitely a trace gas. But you can see that by 2001, we have gone, uh, 2020, we're going to hit about uh, 470, I think, maybe, maybe not. That was a projection back from uh, 2001. Uh, we are at about 415 to 420 right now, I think, somewhere there. So obviously we won't be at 470 next year, but we are headed. This is going to get uh, close if we continue at 3% uh, rise per year. This is also going to be very close uh, if we continue the emissions uh, the way we are going, unless 
some great technology comes along and starts to take down uh, CO2 from the air. So if you think about all the emissions, this doesn't say what the sources are, but obviously where the power plants are and so on, the stationary sources, you can probably, you are, there are already many carbon capture and sequestration uh, installations, especially in places like Sweden, Denmark, uh, and so on. They, they do work, but most of the emission comes from distributed sources like vehicles and airplanes and so on, which we haven't figured out how to capture yet. And the contribution is being trying to be reduced by adding ethanol um, and so on, but obviously we have a long way to go. The challenge will always be to try to uh, explain to normal, ordinary people uh, why CO2 inc increases monotonically and why we are so sure about uh, how much CO2 we are putting in. But temperature doesn't increase monotonically, it goes up and down. So you can count La Niñas and El Niños here, for example, when this was made, 1998 was uh, the big El Niño of uh, the century, now 2015, was the next big El Nino of the 21st century. And that means there are contributions from what we call internal variabilities or natural variability. So when you have natural variability that is globally cooling, then obviously the global mean temperature dips. There are some uncertainties associated with data in this period because of the war during the war, Second World War, the data gathering effort, uh, sh ships of opportunity, volunteer observing ships, everything was disturbed, perturbed, stopped, uh, reduced, whatever. But people have gone back and reprocessed those things and they have been corrected. But nonetheless, cannot ignore the fact that you have ups and downs in uh, the global warming because of natural variabilities, okay? Um, we mentioned this already several times, the global warming potential, which is something very important to remember. So lifetimes and global warming potential and the sources. Carbon dioxide uh, stays around for 50 to 200 years, depending on uh, the sink. And we consider that to have a global warming potential of one. These are quantifiable effects, so with each uh, ppm increase or uh, what is the perturbation to the long wave radiation you would get. Methane has uh, residence time about a decade, but it has 21 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide. So it's not just the concentration, you have to also worry about how powerful it is as a greenhouse gas. So the concentration, residence time and green, greenhouse warming potential. These three things have to be considered together to see uh, where you want to put energy. So when we start to do projections, basically we have to see what are the biggest contributors, which sectors contribute the largest to greenhouse gas concentrations or greenhouse gas effect. Nitrous oxide, mostly from agriculture, uh, most of it is natural, about one third is uh, anthropogenic. Uh, is sticks around for 120 years and has 310 times the global warming potential. Remember, this is in parts per billion, just like methane, but methane is now around 1,800 parts per billion. Nitrous oxide is only about 400, but you can imagine the difference in greenhouse warming potential plus the residence time. So nitrous oxide sticks around for quite a long time. This is the bad news that came out after Montreal Protocol. We can see that some HFCs can stick around for centuries, but the worst news is of course that global warming potential of the HFCs ranges from 150 to 11,700. So obviously uh, Paris Agreement did try to uh, make agreements on when this will be phased out, but Right now, there is no alternate technology. Uh, what is being done right now uh, are called 5X challenges, for example, where you try to make uh, things like air conditioners five times as efficient as possible so that you can reduce the emission of use and emission of 
uh, HFCs. So for a country like India, where it's warming very rapidly and economy is developing very rapidly, if you go around what happens, number of air conditioners increases exponentially, right? So this is bad news in multiple ways. Everything will, is going to multiply very quickly. So uh, Annex 2 countries like India have been given extra time to phase out HFCs, but unless they invent it, it's not clear how much they have to pay if somebody else invents a replacement and wants to sell you that. So which means there is again going to be a battle in 10, 15 years as to how to deal with uh, HFCs. Per fluorocarbons, again, bad news, primarily comes from aluminum production and se semiconductor manufacturing. Now you know that semiconductors are pretty much everywhere in everything, including cars and bicycles and watches and so on and so forth. So every technology we have is, makes life very convenient, but it comes with uh, some huge side effects always, right? Uh, sulfur hexafluoride used in electric power transmission and semiconductor industries, 23,900 times uh, the CO2 in terms of its effect sticks around for 3,200 years, okay? The other news is that many of these things, they can be found in the ocean. Somehow CFCs, HFCs, even the stuff from nuclear tests like tritium uh, and so on, they obviously get taken up by the ocean and they stick around. So you can tra tra track them in the ocean for great distances and great depths. Is, uh, CO2? Yes, CO2 is one. So everything is with respect. As we said, uh, shortwave photons are coming in. Most of these are transparent to shortwave. Some of them, like water and CO2, can absorb both. And when the OLR goes out, the energy of the molecule greenhouse gases is increased. Usually, symmetric molecules like N2 and O2 do not uh, absorb photons of OLR but CO2 does even though it's symmetric because it has a bending mode. So it depends on what energy gets excited. So when you do calculations of where global warming is going and when you make projections, obviously you take in those into account. But this is a very well-defined quantity. Given the uh, molecule's sensitivity to OLR, how much does it absorb? Why do you want to contaminate it by adding random things? Those are integrals which you can be performing separately, right? You don't need global warming potential. It's a well-defined quantity. You need to know the energy balance. Obviously, then you have to worry about who's taking up carbon dioxide and who's taking up methane. Methane is very highly oxidizable, gets easily oxidized into carbon monoxide. Now, residence time is one thing, but it also reacts much more where this doesn't react. So there are a thousand complications. Why add every random thing into it? When you do the full calculation in the model, obviously everything gets taken into account. Sources, sinks, plus residence time, chemical reaction, ocean sources, and so on and so forth. So there's no point adding. You don't need to use, in, when you have a model, you are carrying methane and its properties. So you don't have to tell the model or make it 21 times more powerful. It has to be automatically, it's a part of the primitive or uh, fundamental principles. You don't, need to add every detail. The model has to know the properties, right? That's what chemistry is all about. Okay, we, we look at that just to get a sense of what contributions are coming from in terms of global warming potential. Something to keep in mind. Plus it gives you targets, right? You know HFCs are bad. They can live long time and they have a very high potential. 
So you need to clean them out quickly. So all the data that is coming in, um, the, we have a graph in the PDF that we said before. I'm not going to go back now, but you can see the numbers we looked at. CO2 is parts per million, methane and NO2 are, N2O are parts per billion, HH3CFC is parts per trillion. Um, there is enormous amount of technology going into observing, obviously, satellites. This is often referred to as the second Copernican revolution. Uh, why? Because during Copernicus, basically the geocentric view went away and the heliocentric view came along. Um, we, this, we realized that Earth is not the center of the universe, that Earth is uh, uh, rotating around the sun. And people, so microscope was invented, telescope was invented, we were sitting on Earth looking out or looking into smaller and smaller things. Uh, industrial revolution came along. Uh, you would invent things on your own and make a lot of money. And slowly now, if you think about satellite revolution, we're going out of the Earth and looking back at Earth and trying to get as many details about Earth as possible for land, ocean, atmosphere, and so on and so forth. Plus, now, bigger and bigger corporations. So you work in big teams often and you invent things together. IPCC does lots of big science and so on and so forth. But observing the ocean is always difficult because light doesn't penetrate very deep. Only if you, typically, if, what are you measuring? You are either sending down a laser or a microwave and trying to find the time it takes to travel back, or you are looking at the radiances coming back. So if you remember your greenhouse gases that are absorbing the OLR, then you're looking for windows where OLR is not being absorbed, but can reach the satellite. So you can measure uh, water vapor or clouds or sea surface temperature or chlorophyll and so on and so forth. So observing the deeper ocean is now becoming uh, a big target for uh, robots, autonomous vehicles, uh, self-propagating systems and so on and so forth. The most amazing thing that came along around 15 years ago is called Argo. I know maybe somebody, has, some of you have heard about. It's a profiler that uh, stays at around uh, 2,000 meters or 1,000 meters and comes, back, comes up to the surface uh, every few days and then beams the data to the satellite. Why does it stay at 2,000 meters or 1,000 meters? I won't be, I'll be surprised if you know the answer. Basically, near the surface, what do you have? You have a lot of photosynthesis and biology. Anything you put in the ocean becomes what is called a fad. It's a fish aggregating device. Basically, that means barnacles grow on it, whether it's a ship or a mooring or a whatever it is. And then small fish come along and then big fish come along. And there are moorings uh, in the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic oceans. It's a big problem. Scandal, uh, vandalism is a big problem because fishermen go in the middle of the ocean. There is nobody. There are a lot of fish around this nice uh, instrument. So they anchor their boats, and then they damage the instruments. And they even cut off good-looking anemometers and whatever else. And sometimes you can follow the GPS to a fishing village and so on and so forth. So that's why if you go deeper, there is no biology. The biofouling is greatly reduced. So when you put instruments near the surface, it's always a problem because biofouling makes them uh, unfunctional, dysfunctional, whatever, very quickly. Okay. So these are the kind of combinations. Argo is now covering a large part of the ocean. These dots are very big, so it looks like a lot, but there are about 4,000 to 5,000 Argo floats. Uh, around the world ocean at any time. Obviously, if you remember your uh, ocean circulation now, the deep ocean is also drifting very slowly, few millimeters per second, whereas as you come closer to the surface, you can have currents that are a few centimeters or maybe a meter or so per second. 
and where you have strong Ekman divergence, obviously you'll have a hard time keeping the Argo float. If it comes up, it's gonna go drifting and so on and so forth. So all those things have to be uh, taken into account. So if you go look at uh, the data coming in every day, there's lots of data coming in from the ocean as well. We can right now find out what is the temperature in the middle of the tropical Pacific Ocean, what are the winds and so on and so forth. So this is again looking at the temperature. I keep, I'll keep showing this in many ways because you have to always remember that the carbon dioxide is going straight up with the seasonal cycle. Very accurate, very precise measurement. You can measure it again and again very accurately in many places. And it's well mixed gas. So it, a one measurement in a hemisphere will give you hemispheric concentration. Whereas global temperatures obviously averaging over very large ranges minus 50 degrees at the poles to 32, 34, 35 degrees uh, in the tropics and so on. And some data problems during the war, as I said, but there was a cooling that happened in the 60s and 70s. And in fact, there were one or two reports saying next ice age is coming. But since then, we have taken off. And despite the ups and downs, we'll see later on that um, decade to decade, uh, each decade is warmer than the previous decade for the last five to six decades. So even, even though year by year temperature may go up or down, the average temperature is monotonically moving up. Uh, we will see this again, but this should be blue actually. These are the regions where uh, warming is not happening and maybe even some cooling is happening. This region you are very familiar with. If this is cooling or not warming, then we know exactly why very quickly. Why? 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 Huh? Next order is coming from where? Okay, that's the day after tomorrow's story, but right now it's not, Greenland is melting, but it's not necessarily just the freshwater flux that's perturbing the deep water formation and the meridional overturning and the heat transport. It's also the changes in the overall wind driven circulation. Remember, even though we neatly separated the ocean circulation into wind driven and thermohaline, line, they are not really independent, okay? Because evaporation is very critical, which depends on air temperature, which depends on winds, and it also depends on winds, which depend on temperature. So there's all these complicated feedbacks. This is called a, a warming hole in the southeast of US, which is related to some local interactions between a very fast warming Gulf of Mexico, uh, a, a low level jet, southerly jet coming from uh, Mexico, South America towards uh, the Great Plains and so on and so forth. But the point is global warming will not be uniform, okay? You can see some evidence that there is more warming here than here. There's more warming here maybe than in the tropics. Several reasons, right? Everybody knows already why high latitude should warm more. Hmm? Cloud. More insulation is more at higher latitude. What? Hadley cells is coming down here at 60 north. Where is Hadley cell coming down? 30 degrees, and why are you pointing to this? We call this the polar amplification, even though that's not necessarily the poles, but you can see poles have data problems, even though now the holes have been filled with various techniques. Um, lots of Eurasian snow here, right? So you have still the ice albedo feedback, snow albedo feedback happening. Plus you also know that when you have sea surface temperatures that are already near convective threshold, you try to warm it, you are going to have convection and that energy is going to move away from the system. So the tropics, which are already pretty warm, they are not going to warm much more, even though you will see later on that there is warming. For example, the Indian Ocean is warming. If you remember your thermohaline circulation, we said this is a channel. So wind mixing is going very deep, warming will go deeper that will come directly into the Indian Ocean on a very fast time scale. So Indian Ocean, you would expect, will warm faster. So meridional overturning circulation in the Indian Ocean is a very 
interesting problem. Not many people have looked at it. So if you are doing, thinking of doing PhD and so on, you should think about it. Uh, how uh, the Amazon is warming, uh, how the monsoon is changing, uh, how Sahara is warming and so on and so forth are all interesting uh, questions. Again, CO2 concentration monotonic, but you will see some kinks here and there uh, during the war time. And when you have uh, economic, uh, financial, global financial crises, you will have reduced transportation uh, and reduced uh, manufacturing, et cetera, which will show some kinks in CO2, but other than it's pretty much uh, monotonic. But here, the warming has become quite monotonic as well. There are many such animations on, online that you can find. And this is going from 1880, uh, whatever, to uh, you can see that the blues and oranges were a lot in the beginning. But as we get to the later stage after 1980, everything becomes much more red and orange. So obviously, global warming. And you can see there is massive warming here in the later stages. Uh, that is what we called polar amplification. The polar amplification is not as strong yet in Antarctica because of all the complications we've talked about before in terms of the Antarctic circumpolar uh, circulation and so on. What else is happening? The rate of warming itself is not constant. So if you think about uh, starting the measurements or looking at the, the global trends, this is always with respect to some period. So this will be anomalies with respect to, uh, as I mentioned, 1961 to 1990, which is used typically as a period where we compute the climatology and we compute the anomalies or the trends above that. Okay, that's just a chosen period. It doesn't, you can move it around, the numbers will change a little, but the basic story doesn't change that you started warming after industrial revolution because of internal variability and natural variability, whatever you want to call it, you have some ups and downs. The long-term trend here is uh, about 0 0.045 uh, degrees centigrade per decade. But you look at this blue color for the last 100 years, it uh, more than almost 60, 70% increased. And in the last 50 years, again, almost doubled and then it's increased again. So the rate of warming is accelerating. It's not just warming. The rate of warming itself is now accelerating over uh, the decades. So this is what has to be uh, remembered for projections. We'll look at this a couple of times. So what we said was, when you look at a trend like this over, let's say, 100 years, you say, I'm detecting a warming signal. Okay, you have to be careful because here, if you look at 25 years, a statistician will tell you that that is not enough to call it a trend. Usually it is referred to as a specular trend, which means it's local in time. Why? What are the time scales of variability we looked at at those kind of time scales? These are called secular trends because they are not long enough. This is long enough, but we don't know whether there is a 100 year or 200 year oscillation in the Earth system. So what do we do? We take the CO2 and say, there is, is there a relation between increasing CO2 and increasing global mean temperature? That's what you want to do. That's what is called detection and attribution. So if you look at 25 years, the problem is we said things like North Atlantic oscillation and the Pacific decadal oscillations have time scales of 20, 30 years. So there is no guarantee that this is a trend. This may go up and this may come down again, right? This happens a lot to the monsoon. For example, monsoon has a 20, 30 year time scale and maybe even a 60 year time scale, even though we don't have enough data to sample the 60 year time scale very well. So whenever you look at trends of 20 years in monsoon, you have to be careful because that may be a secular trend or it may be part of a natural variability. 
Okay, the other thing that becomes even more complicated is, even if this is, there is a time scale of natural variability at 25 years, the harder question is, how is global warming modulating this natural variability? So it's, we can always go back to El Nino as your poster child for natural variability and say, we know uh, El Nino happens every two to seven years. How will global warming change this? Because you are changing East Pacific, you are changing West Pacific, you are changing the sea surface temperature gradient, you are changing the winds, you are changing the monsoons. Everything is changing because of global warming. So there's no evidence that El Nino will go away. Then the question is, what will happen to El Nino? Will it become more frequent, less frequent, stronger, weaker, and so on and so forth. That, those are even more difficult than, as I said, Right now, there is absolutely no consensus on what will happen to El Nino with global warming. Just because we don't have enough samples, let's say from the 20th century or from this period. If we had lots of El Nino during this period, then maybe we could have said warming is going to do something to El Nino. But if you only have about 10, 20 El Ninos, then that's not enough to say something yet, okay? Keeping all that in mind, you detect the signature, so you say from 1900 to uh, 2010 or so, uh, there have been ups and downs. So black line here is the observed global temperature, and the red line here is what the models, models have produced. These are the different model ranges in yellow. So not every model is producing the same kind of warming rate or change in warming rate. Nonetheless, if you take the average of all the models, then you see that models are doing a very reasonable job of reproducing the warming rates and maybe even the change in the warming rates as a whole. Okay. Many, 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 many issues here because you see that observed variability has lots of ups and downs, which we said is internal variability or natural variability. But the models don't necessarily do all of them. They do this pretty well, which is like a regime shift. They do this uh, change, this change, and so on. But in general, they don't do, which means if you take a model and you simulate the 20th century with this model, it will not necessarily produce El Ninos in the same years as the natural world. It will produce its own El Ninos, which may be happening also, let's say, approximately every four years. But 1998 in the real world is a strong El Nino, but in the model, 1998 need not necessarily be a strong El Nino. It gets confusing, but you just remember. What is very reliable is, given all the greenhouse gas forcing and volcanic forcing and so on and so forth, the models are able to reproduce the trend because you are, what are the models doing? You have the ocean, you have the atmosphere, you have land, you have ice, you have vegetation, and so on and so forth, and you have chemistry, greenhouse gases. You give it energy at the top of the atmosphere, right? It takes the energy, distributes it, produces equator to pole temperature gradient, produces winds, currents, monsoons, El Ninos, CO, NAO, and so on and it gives you an energy balance, okay? If you change that energy by changing greenhouse gases or volcanoes, it will produce the response of the global temperature to that energy balance, but doesn't mean it will produce the internal variability exactly like the real world. What is another way of thinking about it? If you are thinking about weather, for example, you don't, when you want to make a weather forecast, the weather for the next few hours to next few days will depend on temperature, let's say temperature, humidity, and winds at every point on the globe at this instant. So if you want to make a forecast, you have to start the model with the same exact temperature, humidity, and winds at every grid point and then integrate forward. Then, maybe you will get the same weather as what you will observe. But the system is so nonlinear, the evaporation, condensation, and other things that happen, storms, etc., can 
change the weather randomly, which means mother nature is giving you one realization. It is making one integration and it's going to end up somewhere. But the model is doing its own integration. There is no guarantee in a nonlinear system that you will end up in the same. So let's say these are the various initial conditions and these are the potential solutions. Mother Nature is doing one thing. Your model will try very hard to do the same thing, but there is no guarantee or there is no expectation that that's what will happen. Any small difference here will give you very different solution, okay? So you can think of these different models as giving you the range of the solutions that Mother Nature could have produced. But Mother Nature produced this particular realization. Yeah. The There is just more uncertainty in the forcing itself here. As we said, uh, there are lots of data issues and so on and so forth, uh, volcanoes. Yep, as you go back, you have to prescribe volcanoes, you have to prescribe land use change, how much deforestation happened, how much agriculture happened. So you are trying hard to prescribe all the forcing here, but we have much more information here. So does that mean Projections will be better, not necessarily, we will see that. So we are detecting a signature and we are saying the models are able to produce the signal. Signal is the global warming. Then the next question is how do we know this is caused by carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases? The good thing about the models is you can take the same model and remove all the uh, carbon green, greenhouse gas forcing and take out methane, you can take out CO2, N2O, and so on. And you make another integration, and you will see that if you don't give it the greenhouse gases, the models don't produce the warming at all. This is called attribution. So you detected the signal, then you want to find a way to attribute the cause for the warming. And this is a way to do it. Obviously very hard to do it from data alone, you obviously rely on uh, models. And now this is becoming more and more common because when you have a flood like Kerala or let's say this year's Mumbai flood, now I think Assam is flooding. You want to see if these floods are being made more probable because of global warming. So you can also do these kind of experiments using models to say, yes, the probability of an event was increased by global warming by so much and so on. So this is now showing a global map of various uh, detection uh, attribution for each uh, part of the world, North Pacific, South Pacific, um, so land, ocean, ocean heat content, Arctic, so on and so forth. You can see that there are larger uncertainties in some regions than in others. So these bands of green and orange are the uncertainties or model spreads as we say them. But it's pretty clear that wherever you go, North Pacific, North America, North Atlantic, Europe, Asia, and so on, the warming is always related to greenhouse gas effects. So increased carbon dioxide, where you look at land, ocean, or ocean heat content, it's always attributable to greenhouse gas increases. That's one way we can say for sure that these kind of contributions are me being made, where now we are looking, instead of radiative forcing, we are looking at the uh, warming. And we are saying here is the observed warming with some uncertainty. Greenhouse gases have a large uncertainty basically because CO2 is very well constrained, but methane and N2O are not, CFCs and HFCs are not as well constrained and so on. Other anthropogenic sourcing like deforestation, land use change, uh, urbanization, and so on are potentially giving you some cooling because they are increasing the albedo. Combined anthropogenic forcing is definitely a positive and it pretty well matches the observed warming. So the natural forcings are there, but they are tiny compared to the human impact. 
natural internal variability is also contributing and it's tiny compared to organic um, forcing. Okay. Ocean, as we said, is taking up almost 93% of all the energy that's being produced by increased greenhouse gases. Um, ocean has a high heat capacity, covers 70% of the um, Earth's surface and it's several kilometers deep. Obviously, it can keep lots of heat in it. So when the global cooling happened in the 60s, 70s, ocean heat uh, was lower than the uh, average base period of the 1961 to 1990. And you can see that the land, ocean, atmosphere, land, ice, atmosphere together are keeping some, so, some part of the total energy. Uh, from 700 to 2,000 meters, there is some amount of energy in the ocean. Why is this much more than here? How, how does the heat get into the ocean? about the energy because of greenhouse effect, global warming energy, right? This is the change in the total heat content, the change. Hmm? Louder, what? How? Huh? My line. Precipitation is net has to be zero, right? You have to evaporate, you have to precipitate. precipitate precipitation cannot keep coming from somewhere. 86% of the evaporation happens from the ocean. Some 72% falls back on the ocean. So ocean, you have to remember, as we said, it's force from the top, but it's not the diffusion. Diffusion time scale would be too slow. So there's dynamically heat being taken up somewhere. Obviously, thermoaline circulation, deep water formation is one region. The other region that we didn't talk about is where upwelling happens that we mentioned in the tropical Pacific where a lot of heat being taken up, but during El Nino that some of it gets released. So it's a question of how much goes in. There are also regions called ventilation where the uh, deeper part of the ocean sees the surface and then goes back. So these ventilation regions are ventilated to the atmosphere, which means they exchange gas and heat with the atmosphere in these regions. So that's the regions where the thermocline comes very close to the surface or directly to the surface, okay? That's an interesting concept. So the upper ocean obviously sees the heat first and the deeper ocean will take longer time to see the heat. So the question is now, how much heat is getting into the deeper ocean. Good news is that it will stay there for a long time. Bad news that it will begin to diffuse out gases and so on. So uh, you will have, for example, if you reduce the temperature gradient or the uh, gradient of gases and so on, slowly will begin to have diffusion of gases uh, across. Uh, the, from the bottom to the surface and so on. So ocean is also a dynamic medium. So heat is not just diffusing down like a sponge or whatever. It is to be dynamically redistributed. So you can see that quickly with a very nice example. So if you took a north-south uh, section of the change in ocean temperature for a few decades from zero to 700 meters. These are the mean temperatures. We know that there is tropic, warm tropics. There are sinking isotherms here. Why do they sink here quickly? Weight of the glaciers on the ocean, 
glaciers are on land. Speaking of glaciers, high latitudes are just cold and water is well mixed as we said this is when we looked at spring bloom we looked at this and said nutrients are well mixed when sun comes up there is a slight stratification you get blooms and so on and so forth so high latitudes are just well mixed here it's different this is not so high latitude this is at 60 north so you can see 60 south why do we get these domes here for these troughs what's happening at these latitudes Hmm? What? Lag. Land. This is ocean. No? Upwelling brings the isotherms down. What does upwelling do? Do you see upwelling somewhere? Convergence has to bring it down. Where does convergence happen? As I said, you have to know these basics like the back of your hand, right? So you have subtropical gyres, convergence in the atmosphere, you have sinking of Hadley cells. Here you have subtropical gyres and convergence, so isotherms. Convergence means water going down, so warm waters are coming down, right? So you have higher, so if you go from the equator in the Pacific to the middle of the subtropical gyre, sea level rises by half a meter because water is converging and piling up warm water. Upwelling is where you have isotherms going up. This is in the Atlantic, so not very strong upwelling. And why is deep water, uh, I already said it, the heat is sinking here much further down because the ocean is taking down the warmth with the deep water formation. This is the process that we always talk about where the gases, greenhouse gases, and the heat is going down into the ocean. Okay, so wherever these thermocline is basically coming up, these not everywhere, but there are places where the thermocline is brought up to the surface, like under the IPCC, where ventilation happens, but we won't go into all that detail here. So these are the sea level changes that are observed since uh, about the industrial revolution. As you can see, uncertainty is higher in the beginning, but now there is a satellite data that's available since about 1992, which shows uh, the uh, sea level rise as well as the tide gauges, which have been around for a long time. Places like Venice and so on have uh, tide gauges going back to several centuries. Nonetheless, with the warming, you expect sea level rise. We call this sea level rise as what? Was, is this eustatic or isostatic? Hmm? Sure. So dynamically speaking, again, sea level is also not, it's not a rising everywhere. You expect that there will be places where sea level is rising and there will be places where sea level is sinking. So this is for the, uh, period of 1993 to 2003. Uh, obviously, the map will look different if you take longer period uh, or even the satellite data now from 2003 to 2018 or so and so on and so forth. The main point is uh, you have the subtropical gyres, you have the subpolar gyre, you have the upwelling regions and so on and so forth. And again, the point is just as the where the ocean heat goes in depends on ocean dynamics. Where the sea level rises also depends on ocean dynamics. It's like the coffee cup that's sitting, obviously its level is flat, but if I do that, I'll spill some coffee, but you'll see that if you put a spoon and circulate it, you'll see that the coffee will be down in the middle and up at the edges and so on. So it's a rotating system, right? The most difficult part of doing global warming projections or weather forecast or climate forecast is precipitation. Precipitation is a nightmare. I don't know if I have a figure here. 
So precipitation you can think of as a popcorn kettle. If you are heating the popcorn kettle, the temperature is obviously very fairly uniform. There will be very, very little temperature gradients. But when you put the kernels there, it's very hard to predict which corn uh, kernel will pop next because it's just going boom, 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 boom everywhere, right? So little difference in the its surface area, how much heat it's absorbing and so on will make it pop. So the precipitation is exactly like that. So I don't know if I have another figure of the satellite image. If you look, I think I showed it before. If you look at satellite image at any given instant, you will see a lot of popcorns. It will be raining in many places. In fact, this is a very good problem that people like Fenbert work on. How often does it rain, right? What determines how often it rains? It's always raining somewhere on the globe, right? So it's very interesting to sit down and think about how often should it rain in terms of energy balance? Because you are evaporating a lot of water from everywhere, you are condensing it in the atmosphere, or you are at least forming clouds. And globally, any condensation that leads to precipitation has to be balanced by that energy loss to space. So there's kind of a global constraint. And then within that, you have all these instabilities and so on and so forth. So if you look at the uh, anomalies in uh, global uh, precipitation from 1900 to 2000, whatever. There are several reconstructions, global historical climatology network that's filtered. There's GPCP group from NASA, there's crew from East Anglia, and so on and so forth. And GPCP has itself several products, one, two, three, depending on whether it's only based on gauges, whether they mix satellites, how they mix satellites, whether they mix microwave or uh, infrared and so on and so forth. But the main point is you can see that there are huge differences in the precipitation products, okay? So here it is, uh, this one is increasing at some rate, this one is increasing at some rate, this one is dipping heavily here, this one is not even barely getting negatives and so on and so forth. So precipitation remains a serious nightmare. So I won't go through this animation. Do we need to go through this animation again? So we have heating rising air, so we have the Hadley cells. We never show this here because we said angular momentum conservation fails, things split in, uh, break down into uh, cyclones, anticyclones, and so on. And I think there may be a way to add seasonality to it, I hope maybe. Um, this is the meridional, uh, sorry, the surface winds. You have northeast straits, southeast straits converging into the IPCC. Uh, you have subtropical highs, so you have divergence out of it. So wherever you have high sinking air, clear skies, no rain, uh, and so on. So that's why you have ocean uh, deserts here as well as land deserts. You have mid-latitude westerlies. Even though we call them westerlies, they are usually um, southwesterlies and northwesterlies in the hemisphere. And there is polar easterlies that we talked about. So high pressure and low pressure here. So winds coming south, Coriolis turning it to the right. So you have weak westerlies. And because of the various uh, dynamic reasons, you get, get these strong uh, jet streams. As I said, the amazing thing to always remember is that if you have near surface winds that are westerlies, that means despite the friction, they are moving faster than the planet. So energy has to be coming from somewhere. So it comes from above and the angular momentum that's being transported. Uh, there are lots of details. Angular momentum doesn't get trans, uh, conserved. Only thing, only constraint we have is that the energy must move constantly from lower latitudes to uh, the poles because of the energy surplus and the energy deficit and so on. And if you add upper level atmospheric flow to it, now you clearly see the jet stream. You get uh, so these things that are being shown here. 
Again, the thing to remember is that the upper level winds are all the way to the pole. So even though you have this loop here, you can see that the upper level winds keep going uh, to the poles, uh, at least into the jet stream and so on. So all those things cannot be done without dynamics, which we didn't do much of here. But hopefully the animation gives you, ah, here is the seasonality of it. So if you add seasonality to it now, again, the Hadley cells and the polar fronts, what do you expect with seasonality? You expect the whole system to move back and forth. So as the sun moves, that sits. As the sun moves, sun comes up in spring into the northern hemisphere, Hadley cell convergence zone, ITCG, everything moves, sun moves south, the whole system moves. So there is cross equatorial flow in the atmosphere. As we said in the ocean, it's very difficult because of the changing Coriolis, but nonetheless, it happens in western boundary currents uh, where you can generate or destroy vorticity. There's an, another detail called potential vorticity, which we won't go into. But if we add ITCG, we see that when we have the monsoon, the ITCG way north uh, into the South Asian and Chinese uh, soon regions. But if we get time later on this week, uh, we will see a bit more about the monsoons and we'll see that the ITCG behaves very differently in uh, the Indian Ocean. So these subtropical gyres grow and shrink. We can see in the winter, the subtropical high is very high, uh, no rain, uh, strong desert circulation, subtropical low gets uh, deep. And if you look at it again, the high expands and then shrinks back, right? So entire system, you can think of ITCG as the hemispheric equalizer that's going back and forth. Obviously, if you add precipitation to it, you will see deserts with very low precipitation and again, the monsoon circulation. So West African monsoon, South American monsoon, uh, South Asian monsoon, even these regions which where it rains all year long, they also have a weak rainy season during boreal summer months, July, August, and a strong rainy season during uh, December, January, and so on. Okay, so that is just to reinforce some of the uh, points we have made from the very first lecture. So this is the uh, summer position of the ITCZ. This is the winter position of the ITCZ. We already talked about why ITCZ stays north in some places uh, and so on. But you can also see uh, in the context of greening of Africa 9,000 years ago and so on, how the ITCZ position change on long time scales, precession time scales would have affected uh, climate on paleoclimate time scales or centennial, millennial time scales and so forth. You can also see why you have the Amazon forests here or the rainforests here and rainforest here and so on and so forth. Some people now have coined the terminology as global monsoons, but I'm not sure I find it. Uh, very so here is the ITCZ again. There are lots of cute fluid dynamics uh, that goes on as to why these things have such angles and so on and so forth it has to do with moving energy north again. But coming back to uh, precipitation, I want to reinforce. This is now looking at uh, trends in annual precipitation from 1901 to 2005. You won't see it very clearly, but if you look at various uh, regions, you will see that the different products, there are several different products here, which I did the, the legend, but doesn't matter. The, there's a green line and there's a magenta line. And you can see that they are not always agreeing together at all. And in some, time, in some places, they are even in the opposite. One is saying rainfall is decreasing, the other one is saying rainfall is increasing. And they all rely on the same, essentially the same data. So you can go and find multiple monsoon products and you can find slightly different answers as to what is happening to the trend and what is happening to the extremes and so on and so forth. So if you remember nothing, just remember that precipitation remains a serious problems for measuring and 
for modeling. Because if you remember the decorrelation scale uh, idea, then temperature is highly correlated at all points, but the popcorn will be basically uncorrelated where it's coming up. So it fits, as we said before, the temperature now may be the same from North Bangalore to South Bangalore, but it could be raining somewhere and not here, right? So the decorrelation scale of rainfall is very small. Large scale instabilities build up, okay? But within that, rain acts like a popcorn. So you can think of this as a large scale instability and each kernel as a convective system. So even in the ITCZ, even though there is high rainfall, high mean rainfall, you will have convective systems which have a certain scale. They are not just one big bucket falling down all the time. Right? That's what makes it difficult uh, to do these things. What else has been observed already? So we are slowly moving into projections in the next chapter. So we'll wrap up the uh, observed climate change. So cold nights, these are the trends in days per decade. Wherever you have the black and uh, reddish uh, area, the number of cold days are decreasing. So you can see that there are very few places where the, the number of cold days are increasing. Pretty much everywhere they are decreasing. And the same thing for warm nights. Number of warm nights are actually increasing everywhere, hardly decreasing anywhere. Okay, there are reasons why um, cold nights trend faster than uh, warm nights and so on. It has to do with energy balance, uh, cloud distribution, etc. But we won't go into that. Okay. Uh, actually, that's not supposed to be black, but the way it's getting translated, the slight difference in you can see the difference better here. Anyway, maybe some graduate student did that. Cold days decreasing. So these are increasing. These are both uh, warm days are increasing. Cold days are decreasing. So in a lo lot of places, number of cold days are decreasing. All these will have impacts on everything from crops, vegetation, including mosquitoes, for example, if you have uh, wheat growing as a winter crop, and if the minimum temperature keeps increasing, this is going to be bad news for wheat. Plus, the insects, a lot of the, the pests, their life cycle depends on the number of frost days or number of freezing days and so on. If the number of frost days decreases, then the amount of pests will increase, number of diseases will increase. Temperature immediately favors bacteria, viruses, pests, and so on and so forth. Obviously affects uh, health as well. So this is again looking at rainfall in various measures. So this is uh, as extremes, 95th percentile, or daily precipitation intensity, or frequency of annual maximum number of consecutive dry days, and so on and so forth. And you can see that every one of them is, is bad news, okay? Uh, means are decreasing, consecutive dry days are uh, decreasing or increasing. There is a mix there. We will see another drought index. So this is another thing that happens. When it, with global warming, you will get more floods and more droughts. For example, now Mumbai and, and Northeast India are getting more and more droughts and they are becoming widespread or whatever. And places like Marathwada and North Karnataka, there's evidence that they are getting more and more droughts. What else happens? Drought is what? You can basically think of it as meteorological drought, which means you have just a rainfall anomaly, or agricultural drought, which means you are not having enough soil moisture for agriculture. And you can also have a drought, drought where there is not enough water resources and so on. Um, so, as global warming happens, the same amount of negative anomaly can produce much worse drought conditions because evaporation increases by a lot when you have global warming. So the soil moisture will be lost much quicker, right? So you have 
the ability to places like California, for example, the rainfall anomaly is not the only cause that's for drought. The warming is making the droughts much worse in many of those uh, places. So this is something uh, that is. Ground temperatures, the so-called boreholes, which are typically narrow, deep holes that are dr driven, uh, drilled for exploring gas and oil and so on and so forth. Lots of measurements everywhere. And you can see that with time, uh, the ground temperatures are warming everywhere, which is just consistent with uh, the global warming. Glaciers are melting in the Andes, in the Rockies and uh, uh, Alps, uh, Himalayas, Kilimanjaro and so on and so forth. You can expect that's what will happen. So when you think about global warming, you also have to realize that when we said uh, temperature doesn't increase monotonically, some of the energy is going into melting glaciers. Some of the energy is going into evaporating oceans. So even though you're increasing CO2 or greenhouse gases and you're increasing the amount of heat, that energy, a lot of, we said 90% is going into the ocean, but you're also distributing energy for all these other processes that are not very easy to uh, compute. Just like we said, Antarctica is a very complicated place. Himalayas also turn, turn out to be very complicated place. You have some South Asian influence and the monsoon influence on this side, Indian Ocean influence on this side, mostly westerly disturbances, Mediterranean, North Atlantic influence. Side. And if you can look at uh, precipitation in winter months and summer months, you can see the monsoon influence. So with global warming, the questions are multiple. One is whether the total amount of precipitation is increasing or decreasing, plus um, high, high altitudes, even in the summer you would expect some snow. With global warming, is the snowfall becoming rain? This could be bad news, right? So if instead of snowing on the glaciers, if you start to rain, you will accelerate the, the melting process and you will reduce the accumulation process and so on and so forth. So you can see that uh, there are changes across that are being monitored. And somebody had mentioned the Tarakoram anomaly. Uh, it turns out that the uh, Hindu Kush and so on are losing glacier mass, but Tarakoram is gaining basically because it turns out that snowfall is making a huge contribution. So there is some advantage up to some warming. With warming, you increase the water vapor concentration in the uh, atmosphere. So with orography and high altitudes, you can generate a lot more snow. But if you warm beyond certain limit, then obviously snow will become rain and that will be a problem. So just like Antarctica, uh, the Himalaya, Himalayas are having uh, lots of different amplifications of warming. Even the warming, which I didn't have a map here, the warming is not uniform. In some places, the warming rates are faster than the global warming rates, and in some places, it's slower than the global warming rates. These are things that have to be monitored. And those are very sensitive region, regions, right? Siachen, India, and Pakistan spend lots of money to keep a few soldiers there. If they just decide that that's a useless waste of money, then they will just come down and be happy because the soldiers who live, a lot of them die right? because it's not a very friendly place. So unnecessarily, they are putting people there and guarding this little piece of glacier, which is not going to go anywhere, probably just disappear, right? So this is the Arctic story. Um, you can see that uh, Arctic sea ice for any month you look at, it has got a downward trend. Okay, This is the September ice extent, which is decreasing. We said we care about September ice extent. Why? Because quickly. Whatever doesn't go away in September has a likelihood of surviving and growing in the next winter. And March, April snow cover is decreasing as well. So Arctic is in general 
bad news if you think I smell is bad news, but obviously not every country thinks that. Many, many countries are waiting eagerly for the ice to go away. The processes that happen are uh, quite complicated. This is a picture from uh, Greenland where you get, you can see the dirt on the glaciers here. It looks pretty dark. All the pollution, sulfates, and whatever aerosols, etc. they reduce the albedo from 0.9 to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, whatever, can make a huge difference. And once you form a little melt pond, let's say the surface melts and it has water, that has a much lower albedo, so it will absorb more energy and it will keep growing. Then you begin to have these kind of waterfalls, they're called mulans, which will go all the way to the bottom. Strong power of this waterfall, huge amount of water now falling there. And they go to the bottom, all the way bottom, and then they can begin to lubricate the bottom of the glacier, which makes it easier for the glacier to surge. So all these processes are very complicated. When you put it together, this is a very short period, 2003 to 6, 6 to 9, 9 to 12. And wherever you have uh, yellow, uh, green colors are where the ice uh, elevation is uh, increasing. And wherever you have reddish, yellowish color, it is decreasing, which means glacier mass is being lost. And you can see just in the uh, 10 years or so, the areas where the glacier elevation is dropping is increasing very rapidly, okay? Huge amount of work is now being done uh, on Greenland because this is, as we said, um, kind of could be a tipping point. As we said, if it releases a lot of fresh water, it could seriously perturb the ocean circulation and so on. Right now, there is no evidence that uh, MOC will collapse, but we already will see a lot of change, okay? We already saw the global trend map where the North Atlantic is not warming because of the MOC changes and so on. Again, remembering the Atlantic, uh, Antarctic circumpolar current and the fact that warming ice, uh, or sorry, warming ocean can carve the shelf ice or the glaciers that flow onto the ocean, but the warming ocean can also increase air temperature, air humidity, and snowfall rates on some parts of uh, Antarctica. So you can see that uh, melt rates, there are places where it's increasing, and there are places where it's decreasing. So you can see that there are blues where melt rates are increasing, and there are reds where melt rates in meters per year are actually decreasing. Lots of places where there are reds, right? So there is a striking contrast between the west and east, but nonetheless, when you look at the uh, melt and carving also, you have lots of differences depending on where you look. So the main story is that Antarctica is very complicated because it is surrounded by an ocean which is warming and its warming warmth is going deep and the warming ocean can have opposite effects on uh, the glacier. So if the shelf ice breaks off, then the glacier can surge, the grounding line can move, the glacier melting can accelerate and so on and so forth. So you can read a lot about uh, Laurentide uh, Larson, not Lauren. Larson, ice sheet, and so on and so forth. Lots of stories have been written about this. Lots of studies going on there, and so on and so forth. So it's a good. Yeah, so the, you can see that the uh, melt rates are on land. There's melting and carving or on the edges where you are mostly, carving can only happen on the uh, shelf ice, right? So warm ocean is bad news for shelf ice, period. There is no good news coming out of that. So that's what, that's what is shown by the surface. 
the topography is also very complicated. So depending on the wind and the humidity, you can get more snow on one side and less snow on the other side. Everybody knows what permafrost is? Anybody heard of it before? Anybody who's never heard it before? Never heard it before? The others heard it or not admitting? Permafrost is basically frozen soil. Soil that just remains frozen. So high latitudes or in high altitudes, you have deep soil that is actually frozen. All the water in it has frozen. And that is holding, obviously, frozen uh, soil can hold a lot of carbon and a lot of methane. So one of the fears is if it starts melting, suddenly it will release a lot of methane and carbon that's in there. Uh, that was the original hypothesis, but now it turns out that things are a bit more complicated because when the some places where the permafrost is melting on top and forming ponds actually is having photosynthesis and is actually able to sequester some carbon and so on and so forth. So obviously has to be studied more. Nonetheless, the permafrost uh, can be frozen, but can still have vegetation on top because you have a seasonal cycle where the active layer is moving up and down and there is a permanent frozen layer. Permafrost means permanent frozen layer. And with global warming and diffusion of heat from the top into the soil, you expect that the uh, active layer depth is going to increase, which means it's going to get deeper and deeper. So more heat is going, so the seasonal cycle of the active layer is increasing, and the seasonal frozen depth is decreasing. Okay, so this is decreasing and this is increasing, which means the heat is just going deeper into uh, the soil. So this could also turn out to be a tipping point uh, or whatever. And there are some other uh, effects that are a bit more complicated. So if you think about uh, places where the river runoff comes from snow melt, so or ice melt, glacier melt, whatever. So you have uh, accumulation during winter months as spring comes, ice melt, snow melt, etc. starts. A lot of rivers in high latitudes get a lot of their uh, river runoff from such melts. In, even in Himalayas, we get a lot of river runoff from glacier melts, right? So when global warming was not happening, let's say 1978, when the warming was still mild, you had a fairly smooth seasonal cycle of river runoff. Now, because of the warming, you are changing not only maybe amount of snow or snow coming as rain, you are having much more variable discharge rates. Sometimes the maximum discharge is coming earlier because spring warming is coming earlier. Sometimes just that slow, steady seasonal buildup is not there. You are start jumping around uh, from the beginning. This, in some places like Sweden, they are decided that this is bad news, but they will just produce more hydroelectric energy. So they are trying to use it for that. But what is much more insidious is that if you look at all the ecosystems in the river mouths at the oceans or estuaries, all most of the species there, uh, the fish, the crabs, the oysters, etc., they time their life cycle to the snow melt rate because they need the salinity change, they need the temperature change, they need the organic matter that comes in, they need the currents etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So a lot of the ecosystems are getting severely damaged because of this. Plus, you also change the amount of oxygen. So when you get a big pulse of organic matter, instead of a narrow, small pulse, then that organic matter is going to be respired by the bacteria and they will use up all the oxygen. So you are going to have the larvae that are growing during that time end up dying. So there's serious ecosystem impacts of these uh, spring warming that is having a huge impact um, that 
fisheries and so on. And maybe I should stop that, stop there. Um, we should wrap this up hopefully tomorrow and then move to uh, projections. So unless there's a quick question, we'll come back in five, 10 minutes for the question session, right?